Andreas, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Awesome. Um, what do you think of Bitcoin and G? Ah, interesting. Um, yeah, I've looked at uh, some of the details of that research, um, and it incorporates a number of, um, I don't know, interesting evolutions in consensus technology. Um, I think it's pretty audacious to call it Bitcoin NG. Um, we've already had a couple of generations of Bitcoin 2.0 and blockchain 2.0. Um, but it seems like, to me at least, we're still working on Bitcoin 0.8. Uh, <laughs> and, and so it's a bit premature to be talking about the next generation of Bitcoin specifically. Um, but uh, certainly as an experimental platform, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, some possibilities for the future. Um, part of the difficulty, I think, however, is that getting consensus to make major architectural changes, especially to the consensus algorithm, um, that's very difficult. So I really don't see how you go from where we are with Bitcoin today to something like Bitcoin NG. Thanks. What do you think of Bitcoin NG? I think it's really interesting. I think, in particular, what I like about their work is that they really formalize some metrics around gauging the performance of the network. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of in isolation is is a step forward. Uh, I think more um, work along those lines would be really appreciated. I think it's really cool that they ran some rigorous emulations of uh, network traffic to kind of gauge what they're doing. Um, but in general, I, I think the idea of flipping leader election on its head, more or less, <laughs> um, is really, really interesting. And I, I think, of course, uh, you know, things like side chains are going to be critical to scaling Bitcoin in general. But if, if we can get the underlying settlement to happen faster, well, then that's great. And um, NG might be uh, one technique there that, that we can use. Yeah, and uh, arguably sidechains might be one way to test NG more effectively as well. Yeah, I, I actually talked to um, the, the two guys working on it, Cornell, and basically they say they're thinking about going two routes. Um, the first is just setting up an NG network in isolation, you know, kind of tabula rosa, uh, which nobody really wants to do, but they said basically that would help as a proof of concept. Um, just to prove that their network works in the way that they think that it works. Um, but then the second approach they're talking about is actually come up, coming up with a migration strategy and um, you know putting on layers to sort of adapt Bitcoin to uh, you know become NG at some point to some kind of consensus. So it sounds like they're they're putting some thought into that. But well, they shouldn't announce that publicly because Thamus will ban them from our Bitcoin. <laughs> well, yeah, don't tell anybody. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I won't ask um, follow up questions of uh, if you come and walk up to the mic, so don't be scared. Hey. Good evening. I um, wanted to obviously, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the side chains have the greatest mind share among the, the developer community. Um, but are there any particular innovations in some of the other altcoins or other stuff that you think are really worthy, you know, just aren't yet another altcoin that are actually worthy of uh, either investigation or possibly even even incorporating some of those ideas into the big three? Hmm. Uh, good question. Not really sure about that. I would say. Um I think the uh, the proof of stake res research is interesting, and since it's not happening in the big three, um, I think that could be an area where we might see it being applied first in another chain, and then uh, gradually migrated to various things. Um, let's see what else. Sorry, you said proof of st proof of stake. Stake, yeah. Yes. Uh, POS. So alternative consensus mechanisms, basically. Um, I think that's one of the innovations that we might see coming from 
other other chains or coins or developments in that area. Uh, I think uh, zero cash is very interesting. So continued research on um, privacy protecting currencies, I think, is really important. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's all I have for now. It's uh, you know the altcoin space is is great for experimentation. Whether any of those experiments will actually succeed and be adopted into Bitcoin, we'll see. Can you talk a bit about replace by fee and where you see that taking Bitcoin to its future? Um, so replace by fee. Um, I I think it's. I think the first thing about replaced by fee is to, is to realize that replaced by fee is already implemented in some ways, um, meaning that, um, from what I understand, some miners will ignore some of the rules and take a higher fee um, transaction that spends the same inputs. Um, so replaced by fee may be part of the status quo of uh, emergent network consensus as it is today, because um, a lot of miners uh, modify the transaction picking policies and, and may have already implemented various versions of replace by fee, just not in a standardized way. Um, there's there's a couple of variants. There's replace by fee, there's child pays for parents, there's opt-in replace by fee which is the um the change that's recently been merged and i think it has some as an opt-in feature i think it has some very useful properties that um that can allow a fee market to develop more effectively right now one of the challenges with developing a fee market is that the only way to predict what kind of fee you need to pay for a transaction is to look at what's in the mempool at the moment based on your local perspective and estimate what fee it will take to get into the next block. The problem with that is that over the 10 minutes a lot may change. So as you're waiting for a block to be mined, you may find that um, a stress test started, for example, and the average successful fee just quadrupled. And so a transaction that you've already posted uh, does not have sufficient fee to get through. So you can't really have a, a working fee market if you can't do something about a transaction that is sitting. This is combined with the other challenge, which is that Bitcoin transactions don't ever expire, um, which is a feature, not a bug. But at the same time, it means that if you, if you have a, tr a transaction out there that is... Um, that is spending uh, a certain inputs, and at the same time it's stuck in the mempool, uh, not getting into a block and just sitting around, it's going to remain stuck for, for as long as that fee isn't sufficient. So I think replace by fee actually allows you to build a more effective uh, fee market. Does that make sense? Hello, Andreas. Um, Hello. So my question would be, um, what is your opinion on the block size debate? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, question. Uh, my opinion on the block size debate is that it is uh, healthier to not express an opinion on the block size debate. Um, because this, the moment you express an opinion on the block size debate, um, you are simultaneously Hitler and working for the CIA trying to compromise Bitcoin, no matter what the point is. Um, I think the debate has become toxic. Um, you know, I'm guessing a lot of the people in this room are developers. And so if you know a lot of developers and software engineers, one of the things you know is that uh, being right matters to some people. Um, and a lot of strong opinions in the block size debate have become toxic in their tone. And um, I think people don't assume good faith. Uh, and that's a big mistake. We have enough challenges and we'll have enough challenges from the outside the community uh, to be wasting all of this toxic energy beating each other up over uh, minor differences in policy. Uh, I'll tell you the one thing I do believe with the block size debate is that whether it's big blocks or small blocks or slightly bigger blocks or medium-sized blocks, 
um, it won't kill Bitcoin. It won't kill Bitcoin if we um, if we keep blocks small. It won't keep big, kill Bitcoin if we make blocks big. It will it will just change some of the other solutions around it, and it won't change the fundamental principle and nature of Bitcoin. Um, I think all of the argumentation around the block size debate is extremist in nature, in that uh, everybody who has an opinion in this space um, accuses the other side of trying to destroy Bitcoin with their approach, and I, I think that's hyperbolic. So uh, I'm keeping I'm keeping my nose out of it. Um, I'm listening to all of the arguments. I'm much more interested in some of the data-based analysis that's being done. Um, and I, I think the block size debate shows a bigger problem, which is that uh, the the governance of the software project um, is fraught with um, drama, let's say, and and that's not helpful um, because it slows down development and innovation. So that that's all. I I didn't say if I'm a small blockist or a big blockist. I I think I'm a medium blockist. Um, I, I think we're going to end up with blocks bigger than one meg and smaller than eight gig. Um, and somewhere in between there sometime over the next year, it, I think it's inevitable. We're going to go there. It's, it's just a matter of how big and how soon really that's, and, and to fight over how big, how soon as a minor question and pretend that the answer to that question um, will define the very future of civilization and finance as we know it is ridiculous. So I'll stay out of it. Hi, Andres. Hey, good evening. Good evening. So um, I wonder how do you evaluate the possibility of countries and banks uh, holding bitcoins in reserve? Uh, like, do you think it's something that is bound to happen? And if so. Uh, how would that reflect on the Bitcoin ecosystem or on, on Bitcoin itself? And if you think it might not happen, like what are the reasons that you think would prevent that? Uh, I think it's absolutely inevitable that at some point, any organization that is holding a basket of different assets in reserve for whatever reasons um, will include in those in that basket of of reserves and assets some form of decentralized digital currency. I, that's inevitable. Now, whether it's going to be Bitcoin, whether it's going to be anytime soon, whether it's going to be a bank, a central bank, a nation state, or um, or not, I don't know. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see, especially smaller states, um, holding reserves in Bitcoin. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think it's going to. I don't think it's going to do much for or against uh, Bitcoin. Although, if if it happens sooner rather than later, it might drive another little speculation boom and bust cycle. Uh, uh, going to go on the roller coaster again. Do you think if, if that happens, some people say that uh, a lot of players uh, in the economy are waiting for someone big to start holding Bitcoins in reserve, and then everybody else will jump and buy. Do you think that might be the case, or, or? Um, not really. I don't. I don't think there's any, um, you know, big cascade effect of countries. We've got to think about the, the utility of holding Bitcoin in reserve and what that actually delivers to the country that's doing that. Other than for marketing purposes and a political statement, I don't see much practical use at the moment. Um, so I'm not expecting that to be a, you know. A big deal for Bitcoin anytime soon. I could be wrong, so that that's really just speculation. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, Mister. I wanted to ask you. Hello. I wanted to ask you a very simple question. It's uh, would would you read my white paper about anonymous exchange for digital contracts? Oh, of course. I I I'm I mean, I read stuff about Bitcoin. And the ecosystem of decentralized currencies every single day, all the time. Uh, so, <laughs> likewise. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's on uh, statex.io website, and the white paper is the name of the author. Okay, I don't have a pen right here, but um, yeah. Um, Safex.io. Safex.io. I'll try and remember that. If uh, somebody tweets it to me, that would be great. Thank you. See you later. Thanks. 
I'm wondering, do you think that Bitcoin will uh, fall behind at any point uh, with these coins offering, you know, new stuff like smart contracts and stuff like that? Um, do you think it will be able to be added or do you think it won't matter as much? Um, maybe. Um, I mean, there's always a possibility of that happening. I think it's uh, increasingly unlikely. I think there was a, a point somewhere around the beginning of 2012 or the end of 2011 um, when there were some exciting developments in the altcoin space and Bitcoin was still fairly new. It hadn't really established much of a foothold. So, um, yeah, but since then, it seems like the early advantage, the early first mover advantage for a currency and the network effect that it builds, as well as the brand recognition. This is the ironic thing, you know, um, what is Bitcoin's brand at the moment in mainstream consciousness? Um, money used by uh, drug dealers, terrorists, pedophiles, <laughs> and extortionists, um, which which is, uh, well, I, I okay, uh, who in the audience is a drug dealer, pedophile, terrorist, or extortionist? Okay, just a few hands going up. So it's not really the majority. It's, it's just a few, a few uh, people. Um, so, you know, ironically, um, even though the brand itself is, is laughably evil, it's like a caricature of the evil coin, you know, um, you've got the, the evil genius threatening the world and they're like, I want one million Bitcoin. That's how it's going to be from now on. But um, it's still a very powerful brand. Um, I think the idea, people recognize the brand now. They, they identify Bitcoin as something edgy and dangerous and new. Um, that's even more of an early mover advantage than the fact that the technology is established. There's a lot of users who know how to use it, and at the same time, the massive investment in the mining infrastructure. Um, I don't see too many scenarios where that level of network effect can be reversed, or that it can be beaten by something else. But you never know. I mean, we're still so early in the development of this technology that it may seem in the future that you know the success Bitcoin has had so far and the spread it had was really a drop in the bucket when something else suddenly jumps up and takes over. Um, it's a possibility. I, I, when I look at the uh, distribution of, uh, of currencies, uh, whether you look at uh, any of the metrics, uh, market capitalization, transaction volume, um, number of users, uh, number of impressions or media knowledge, you'll see that they all follow a power law distribution. So they, they look like a long tail distribution. You have, you know, the, at the front of the curve, you have something dominating the market about 80%, and then it, it tapers down very, very quickly, and then you have this really, really long tail. Um, that power law distribution is a reflection of network effect, and I think it will persist. So, no, I, d I don't see Bitcoin likely to be overtaken anytime soon by something. Because to, to overcome that network effect, you need a lot more than just a small differentiation. You need a very, very big, compelling differentiator, and one that Bitcoin cannot copy. Uh, just a follow-up. Why do you think there's so much investment in private blockchain? Um, because honestly, because a rather large, rather rich, um, industry, um, is now scared of disruption enough to be desperate enough to try anything. And, um, blockchains are a wonderful technology. They're a mechanism for, um, enriching, uh, blockchain consultants. Uh, by uh, by funding them through idiot bankers who don't understand the technology, so um, you know they're grasping at straws. And I think that when you're faced with massive disruption in your industry, you go for the seemingly more palatable, least offensive uh, variety of revolutionary technology that you can find. Slap it on and and pretend that you're doing something meaningful. So. You know, you're Microsoft, you, you get disrupted by the internet, you build MSN, 
Um, like the internet, only without any of the out-of-control, open-access, permissionless innovation problems. Nice and curated content, we saw how that went. Um, you, know, you like the internet? Great, here's an intranet. It does everything the internet does, only none of the things the internet does. Um, and so, you know, this is this is something you see in um, in a lot of technologies. When you have this level of disruption, the incumbent players um, are desperate to grab on to anything they think might um, save them, and uh, but they can't really play with the real thing because the, the thing about Bitcoin that that's really exciting to me is that it it can't be put into a regulatory box. And these companies live in a regulatory box, so they've tried to find a more um, harmless-sounding thing that they can pretend to innovate on. Um, in fact, funnily enough, someone called me recently and they said, "You know, want to do some blockchain-related stuff with our company?" And I said, "Why? I mean, what is the value it's going to bring?" And I said, "Well, it, it brings really good valuations in the in in the funding rounds." So there's your answer: enriching consultants. Um, thanks Hi. for all you're doing in the Bitcoin community. My question is, <clears throat> there are a couple parts to it, so feel free to answer whatever interests you. Um, it has to do, looking 30, 40, 50 years out, do you see, and I know no one can predict that, but do you see um, the potential for Bitcoin overtaking fiat and replacing fiat? If not, how do you see Bitcoin and fiat potentially um, that relationship working out? And <clears throat> And the kind of the background of that question is, do you have any uh, concerns about the deflationary nature of Bitcoin, if it did um, have more of an influence? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I don't see any scenario in, uh, in, in the next 30 years where Bitcoin replaces fiat in an organized and centralized fashion. Whether you will have um, decentralized network-centric currencies like Bitcoin, with Bitcoin being the pro prominent one, um, playing an increasingly important role in, in electronic commerce, in internet commerce, in cross-border transactions, in international trade, um, and being established among a, a very broad range of currencies, that's going to happen, yes, in the next 30 to 40 years, without a doubt, in my mind. Um, I think what Bitcoin does is it breaks the concept of uh, nation-state currencies and currencies that carry flags. The idea of nation-state monopoly currencies is obsolete. It's, it's as obsolete as having uh, a national automaker and a national airline, a national phone company, a national, um, uh, you know, national airline, or or or. Um, a national currency. All of those things are ridiculous and obsolete. So we will live in a world of, in my opinion, um, hundreds of currencies, and people will have choices. Um, so, but the, the the point is, Bitcoin doesn't replace fiat because uh, Bitcoin is fiat, right? <laughs> um, Bitcoin is fiat because um, it. It has no intrinsic value other than that that arises from its use. Uh, so in a way, um, it, it coexists with all, all of the other currencies and will be much more interchangeable. Now, there are some scenarios where you'll see entire countries effectively substituting their day-to-day -day currency with something decentralized and digital, maybe Bitcoin. Um, but I don't see any governments adopting it, and I certainly don't see any point in making it a monopoly currency in, in any nation. Um, Bitcoin is stateless currency. Bitcoin is currency without a flag. Bitcoin is the internet's money. And so um, you know, it's going to coexist with a lot of other currencies. As for the deflationary nature, um, you know, I think we're going to see... Um, I think we're going to see that uh, deflation is is different in these types of digital currencies. Um, the 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 thing about deflation, the reason deflation is such a scary thing, is that if you see deflation in a currency system where the government has the ability to print infinite amounts of currency, 
um, then the only reason you could possibly have deflation, if you can have unlimited supply, the only reason you would have deflation is if you have a catastrophic collapse in demand. So deflation is a symptom of catastrophic collapse in demand in traditional currencies where you can print infinite amounts of currency. So when you see like examples like the the lost decades of Japan or um, the euro or increasingly nowadays the dollar, uh, where where you're having these deflationary effects, um, where no matter how much money the government pumps out, um, growth and inflation are barely budging. And consumption is dead, and wage growth is zero. Um, that is not a currency deflation. That is a catastrophic collapse in demand. Um, and when you have catastrophic collapse in demand, it's catastrophic. So if you if you only see deflation in traditional currencies under catastrophic collapse in demand, then of course deflation is catastrophic. But but. You know, we also see deflation in other ways. Like, for example, um, I'm 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 speaking to you today uh, using my laptop, which I I bought four years ago. And four years ago, when I bought it, it was maybe sixteen hundred dollars. And today, this laptop costs nine hundred dollars. That's a that's a really really big amount of deflation, right? Um, it's it's terribly deflationary. In fact, I'm now hoarding my laptop uh, <laughs> because of that deflationary effect as an asset, and I'm not going to upgrade for a while because why why buy a laptop today when I can buy it cheaper tomorrow, right? So you can see deflation in our everyday life. We see deflation in the cost of electronics. We see deflation in in consumer electronics. We see it in bandwidth and storage and CPU. Um, all of those are examples of deflation, but because that deflation is not coupled with catastrophic collapse in demand, what it is is actually a, a constrained supply and an increase in value. Um, you don't you don't think of it as something horrible. You don't say, well, oh well, uh, you know, the laptop industry is going to hell because nobody's going to buy a laptop if it's going to cost a third less next year. Uh, people will just hoard their current laptops. All purchasing of laptops will stop, and the economy will grind to a halt. We don't say that, but we say that in currency. And the only reason we say that in currency is because we've only ever experienced deflation through catastrophic collapse in demand. So I, I, I think we need to think differently in terms of currencies that are physically constrained through supply. The other thing is that Bitcoin behaves differently from gold. I mean, precious metals. Um, while they had the characteristic of constrained supply, they're also really, really hard to move around. Um, so, if you have a current account deficit and you need to send, you know, gold to one of your trading partners in order to balance the foreign exchange, that means loading a barge with very, very heavy bricks of metal and 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 sending them. Because if you don't load the barge with heavy bricks of metal and instead you send them a piece of paper that says I owe you, then it's no longer a precious metal currency, it's fiat again. It's you're just using it as a reserve. You turned it into a, a hypothecated asset. Um so so we haven't even seen precious metals effectively used as currency on a large scale because the difficulty of transporting metals um, makes them very, very difficult to use as currency. And, and this is not so long ago. I mean, up until the 1970s, um, countries exchanged barges of gold. Uh, they literally physically transported hundreds of tons of gold around. And so, um, you know, again, you can't really compare Bitcoin to the current uh, systems of exchange we have. That was a rather long answer. I'll try to keep them shorter for the next one. Everybody took a seat because they rest their legs. It's going on for so long. Hi, my name is Cole. Hi, Cole. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the only thing that could overtake Bitcoin as it is in the network, that the hashing power that's out there, would be a better proof-of-work algorithm. This is not an altcoin question, but have you seen any interesting progress in proof of work that maybe actually does something? Well, the 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 the, the consensus algorithms are still developing very very rapidly, but um, so, oh, you left the mic, so maybe I, I've got a little bit of a follow up for you. What do you mean it by better proof of work? Not 
it wasn't a question about consensus. It was a question about proof of work. Um, okay, well, that, but that's... Timecoin attempted right. to, to do something worthwhile with all this power. Have you seen anything else that's even better than that? I'm, I'm going to challenge your question just a tiny bit because all of this power is doing something enormously worthwhile. It is securing the uh, global currency that we use. And in fact, it's securing so uh, it's securing the global currency at a cost um, that uh, you know, compared to the scale of security it's providing is not that expensive. We don't need to scale the mining up with the number of transactions. Arguably, the mining we have now is sufficient to prevent global attacks against the currency. So it's not worthless. It's doing. It's securing the network, and without that, you can't do it. Okay. So let, let me go more directly. Let me go more directly to your question. So, what is a better proof of work um, system or consensus algorithm under that model? Um, here's the problem. The problem is the uh, a lot of the suggestions suggestions that have been proposed uh, prime coin grid coin um, cure coin etc cetera, etc cetera. coins that have a a purpose other than securing Bitcoin or securing the currency they're supporting um, part of the problem with that is that you introduce a, a, an economic externality into the system. The reason proof of work works quite effectively today is because it has a very straightforward um, risk reward um, mechanism for for miners, whereby they can estimate their profitability based on electricity consumption of giga hashes per watt, and based on that calculation on the difficulty, figure out whether they're going to be profitable or not, and either turn off the miners or turn them on and, and start mining. Um, you know that that market-based dynamic is is basically clean. It gives you an immediate feedback mechanism as to the profitability, and you can predict it. Now, the problem is if you introduce an economic externality into that system, it actually muddies the water. Let's say, for example, you're discovering prime numbers. Great. So you're mining for prime numbers and securing the coin at the same time. Well, what is the value of prime numbers? Um, we don't really know what the value of prime numbers. Is. We have some applications for them, which probably makes them useful in some way, and you can probably put a price to that. Um, and let's say you have a price for prime numbers, and and that tells you what the value of them is. And then suddenly you discover, I don't know, a new application for prime numbers, maybe something involving quantum physics or fusion energy or whatever the hell you want to you want to find. Um, and what happens if the value of the prime numbers themselves starts being greater than or equal to the value of securing Bitcoin? Uh, what incentives are the miners following at that time? Essentially, what you're doing is you have two masters. You're splitting your interest between two incentives. An incentive scheme based around securing the network and getting reward, and an incentive scheme based around um, producing this other economic good that has a completely different market dynamic to it. Uh, what if the market for primes collapses suddenly? Uh, what kind of implication will that have on the security of the network? It's hard enough for a miner to, to be able to manage um, the extremely competitive environment of Bitcoin mining as it is without introducing another factor. I like the fact that proof of work does nothing except for securing the most important decentralized currency ever built. Um, because that's a nice focus, and that means that uh, people who are trying to analyze this market and understand the benefits and incentives around it have a clear uh, way of understanding that without any externalities. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea necessarily. So, given what you were just talking about, how do you feel about colored coins? Well, colored coins don't really change um, that at all. But the trick about I, I see what you mean. W what you're saying is, um, if colored coins have implied value that is different from the satoshi that is carried, well, um, when when you're when you're taking a coin and you're you're coloring it, let's say for example, you take a one satoshi value and you say, okay, that's worth one share of IBM. 
um, you're not trying to get both values to be meaningful. What you're doing quite explicitly is taking the least amount of value you can transmit in Satoshis and attaching it to an asset that has far greater value than the face value of the currency it's riding on. Right? Um, this is why you don't take a hundred bitcoins and turn them into a colored coin that corresponds to an IBM share certificate. Um, you take 546 Satoshis, or the smallest number you can get away with, with the fee. And, and that's a very intentional calculation. What you're doing is you're saying, I'm not going to have the two values competing with each other. I'm going to minimize the value in uh, face currency um, and maximize the value of the, of the asset that's carried on top of it, so that the focus is purely on the asset carried on top of it, and you don't have a situation where it's worth less than the paper it's printed on, which is a classic economic expression. But really what you mean there is like, if, if the asset you put on colored coins is worth less than the Satoshis you've encoded, then you've done it wrong, right? So, and in this case, you, you don't have, um, you know, potentially this very large market fluc fluctuation. Uh, part of the problem with doing primes or cure coin or grid coin is that both of those markets could be very large. Uh, whereas if, if you've minimized the amount of coins you put under colored coins, then you're unlikely to have a problem. The other big thing is that you can disentangle the two, um, meaning that I can uncolor coins. Let's say I've colored 546 Satoshis with a share of IBM, and suddenly 546 Satoshis is worth real money. Well, great. So I uncolor the 546 Satoshis, and I then color one Satoshi with the same share certificate. So I can actually change the exchange ratio between them and adapt to the emerging value of the underlying currency. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that, that was a really good, good question, insightful. Yeah. Hey. Um, so, what advice do you have for a, a software engineer who is very interested in Bitcoin, has been reading about Bitcoin for over three years, um, but has uh, hasn't programmed anything around Bitcoin yet, and it's uh, he's very interested in uh, working on Bitcoin in the future, having a professional career, maybe as a consultant. Uh, I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, <laughs> good one. Yeah, so uh, program something in Bitcoin. I mean, here here's the thing. There there are many 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 projects, large and small, that uh, someone can dig into um, from um, from small uh, from small scripts and things that you build for yourself to um, little startup ideas and services that you can offer to supporting testing and quality assurance for the core developers or um, working on an altcoin or whatever you might want to do. There's so much work to be done. Um, I think any software engineer who's work, waiting for a job before they start coding in this uh, space is really missing the point because this being an open source space, start coding and the jobs will come. Hopefully uh, the jobs will come. The better you are at coding, the more jobs will come. You know. Um, I think my first advice would be visit a community of uh, fellow Bitcoin enthusiasts who are also developers. But you've already checked that off your list, so good. <laughs> that's that's pre pretty much the reason why I set up the um, this meetup group uh, w was to encourage people to learn by teaching others. Um, and and that's another one. If you haven't yet gotten into this. Uh, in a big way, one of the ways you can do it is find someone who is even more beginner than you are and teach them about Bitcoin and teach them how to code. And in the process, you will learn um, a lot more about Bitcoin. Okay, are we wrapping it up or are there any um, some more questions? Hi, Andreas. Um, hey, how's it going? Very good. And yourself? Good to see you again. side there's a lot of uh, Bitcoiners who realize that there's not too much privacy in Bitcoin and 
very transparent. Um, and I was wondering what is what are your thoughts around the privacy versus transparency, and where do you see this kind of integration? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I think, uh, as I said before, I think Bitcoin it's easier to achieve radical transparency than it is to achieve radical privacy or radical anonymity. It takes a lot of work to achieve anonymity in the Bitcoin network. Even when the technology exists, the the software that people write and the practices of regular users of the system uh, leave much to be desired. Um, I don't know if it was Christoph who did some research recently. I think it might have been uh, Christoph Atlas, who's who's a very big um, proponent and and developer in, in in privacy matters in Bitcoin. Um, I think he did some research and he found that uh, more than seventy five percent of the transactions um, had reused Bitcoin addresses. Now that's something that if you have even the least amount of understanding and concern about privacy, you don't do, right? Um, and and it's not as if there aren't solutions out there. You can use hierarchical deterministic wallets. You you can even use from from the early days, like I think back in 2011, you could use an electron deterministic wallet and not reuse addresses. Um, even Bitcoin Core was was better at not reusing addresses. So um, the fact that only the, the more than seventy five percent of the transactions re end up reusing addresses means that um, the technology is not broadly used even when it does exist. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that we can introduce more uh, strong anonymity solutions within Bitcoin, and I'm not that worried because I look at Bitcoin as a foundational layer. And I think you can do a lot of things with fungibility and anonymity, even if they're not built into the foundation layer. Whether that's doing Tor on the internet, or doing the equivalent of Tor on Bitcoin. Um, you know, some of the developments in the last couple of years, stealth addresses, uh, which was one of the first ones to be really interesting. Um, more recently, payment codes, which I find absolutely fascinating. I think it's a really, really interesting. Uh, BIP, if you haven't read that, reusable payment codes. Um, I don't remember the BIP number. And um, what was the third one? Oh yeah, and of course, um, CT, confidential transactions. The Greg Maxwell developed on on sidechain elements alpha, uh, which which not only handles uh, encrypting sources and destinations, but more importantly amounts, uh, the actual payload of the transaction, which is a, a major source of um, data analytics and um, statistical analytics that happen on if somebody wants to unravel the the flow of transactions. So in, I mean, I think we're going to see more and more of that work happening. Um, I'm comfortable with a world in which Bitcoin actually encompasses a whole range from radical transparency uh, all the way to radical privacy. Um, I think a healthy state of the world is one in which individuals who are not under um, reasonable suspicion and under due process, um, because of some criminal act, um, should have the absolute strongest privacy they can achieve, right? Um, and governments, um, nonprofit organizations, associations, corporations should have radical transparency. Uh, that would be a world in which um, we would all be more free. Right now, we're actually heading mostly in the opposite direction, where governments have complete secrecy and privacy. Um, and individuals have been completely stripped of privacy. I think that's a very unhealthy state of affairs. So um, I think having Bitcoin express all the range from radical transparency to complete privacy is is great. But keep in mind, what are we comparing it against? We're not comparing Bitcoin against a perfect alternative. We're comparing Bitcoin against two things. One, other digital cryptocurrencies that exist out there. And more importantly, the existing banking and financial system. Um, just today, the uh, 
um, an ISP that has been fighting a national security letter gag order for the last 11 years managed to get a court to release those uh, national security letters. And what we found out was um, uh, quite shocking and horrific. So, um, you know, the, the issue is that in our current financial system, every payment you make ever um, can be accessed by a mid-level government bureaucrat or law enforcement official with nothing more than a than a, a a signature without any court approval or judicial review whatsoever, and that's in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Um, and it gets worse from there. So that's what we're comparing. Um, compared to that, Bitcoin actually uh, is quite a bit stronger. So. Um, and, and there are tools that can make it even stronger, and I hope we're going to continue fighting that fight and making sure that we give people the privacy that they need and deserve. It's a human right. Uh, it's non-negotiable. It's inalienable. Um, and uh, I'm not giving mine up. Hey, hey. Quick question. What are your thoughts on uh, payment channels, like, uh, things like Lightning Network? Um, fantastic. Um, I love, first of all, um, the thing I like about payment channels is that, um, once I understood how it worked, it blew my mind. And the reason it blew my mind is because payment channels is really a demonstration of how you can take two existing capabilities within Bitcoin and reassemble them to make something stunningly novel and innovative. Um, which gave me this insight that, in fact, one of the real powers of Bitcoin is that it, it doesn't implement things in, in complete sentences, or another analogy I use is as molecules. Um, Bitcoin has really, really tiny functional units that are more like atoms or words, and then you can assemble these into sentences. So payment channels is, is two of two multisig plus lock time. And by assembling these two words in a novel sentence, you've invented a whole new um, financial system. Uh, that, is, to me, is really exciting. The fact that you can do that with Bitcoin. Um, the fact that in Bitcoin, there are no... Um, there, there's no such thing as a balance. There's no such thing as a coin. There's no such thing as a sender. There's no such thing as a recipient. All of those things are fictions that we create out of the uh, association of these basically really, really fine-grained building components. So that's a long diversion to say that I really uh, I, I find payment channels fascinating, not because of what you can do with them, which is amazing in itself, but because of where they sprang from and, and how creatively people can combine uh, Bitcoin's fundamental building blocks to make new things. Now, in terms of practical applications, um, you know, I, I think that payment channels, just a straightforward uh, single point to single point payment channel, um, makes micropayments um, doable for the first time. And, and not even micropayments, but micro uh, pico payments, femto payments. Let's use some other metric diminutives. Um, we can do some really interesting things with that. And I can imagine a whole lot of services that we can build now that we couldn't before. With Lightning Network, it gets even more interesting, and I think it also um, can address some of the scalability issues. Um, but whereas point-to-point uh, -point payment channels are already implemented and demonstrated, and and, and functional even without check lock time verify, uh, Lightning Network is still more theoretical. So I'm looking forward to seeing some applications with that. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Hi. Uh, it's just a quick follow-up. Um, if there are more off-chain solutions and to settle or to sort of move uh, value from point A to point B on the main chain, ends up becoming very expensive in the future, whereas somebody could do it today, but not do it tomorrow, maybe five years, ten years down the road, unless they use some kind of off-chain or hybrid solution. Do you think Bitcoin has kind of failed then, since the original mission is to be a cash, a global peer-to-peer -peer cash system, if, if people are actually priced out of the system with effectively censorship? 
Um, no, um, I don't. I think um, generally speaking, I'm 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 both optimistic and and very pragmatic in terms of what can be achieved, and and I think. None of this is black and white. There is no Bitcoin succeeded, Bitcoin failed. Um, Bitcoin will succeed to a certain measure. It will fail to fill other applications. Um, it really that kind of question depends on what you see Bitcoin as fulfilling, and I think it can fulfill a great deal of the original Satoshi um, vision, even if some parts of it scale off chain because. A system that is, you know, broadly decentralized um, and open to permissionless innovation, even if it has some somewhat more centralized, and we don't even know yet if we can do off-chain transactions that are equally decentralized and and scalable uh, as Bitcoin without losing any of the principles of privacy and decentralization. We don't know that yet, but. Let's assume that you have to make some sacrifices there. Then it's still far better than anything we have at the moment, and it's far better than the dystopian nightmare we're heading towards with with uh, uh, a cashless, bankful society. If we're going to have a cashless society, I want a bankless society too. Otherwise, it's too horrible to even imagine. Um, you know, and, and we see that. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, about uh, two months ago, um, in a collaboration between Glenn Greenwald and Jesslyn Raddick, they printed uh, at the Intercept. They published the the drone um, policy manuals, uh, which were basically about uh, drone assassinations by the U.S. government. Um, the four or five whistleblowers who work with Jesslyn Raddick to bring that to our attention have not been charged with any crime, um, have not been prosecuted. Their bank accounts, uh, credit cards, and assets were frozen uh, last week. This was without a court order. This was, again, in the land of the free, in the home of the brave. Um, whistleblowers got their banks frozen and their credit card frozen with no judicial recourse because they weren't actually charged or convicted of any crime. So um, That's a very scary world in my mind. And, um, so I'm I'm perfectly happy with uh, finding ways to scale Bitcoin that are not as decentralized as initially envisioned by Satoshi. A slightly less decentralized solution that we can scale to reach more people is more useful um, than a massively decentralized solution that doesn't scale um, and we can't we can't practically use for more than a few. Hundred thousands, you know, elite educated developers. Uh, that's that's not good either. So um, uh, I'm I'm comfortable with uh, some parts of Bitcoin being off chain, and we'll see. And and if people find a way to scale on chain transactions in a different system, then that will also be a good solution too. I see the, the the pizza has run out, so run out. Oh. it's like, who is this dude? And we're out of pizza. Oh, there's one more question. Yeah, please, if if you have questions, bring them on. Hey there. What technology Hello. or product are you most excited about in its ability to bring Bitcoin to life with ease and grace to make the average everyday person who is usually on the streets care about Bitcoin? Central banking. Central banking is the technology that will make the average mainstream person care about Bitcoin, because it is currently destroying dozens of world economies and will destroy more before the decade is out. Um, there's there's nothing more persuasive about the need for a new currency than the old currency you have going to shit overnight. Just ask someone from Argentina. Or Venezuela, Kazakhstan, uh, Russia, uh, Turkey, uh, South Africa. Um, I can keep going with that list. It's a pretty long list, and it's getting longer every day. Okay, but jokes aside, um, I think it's important to realize that some solutions in Bitcoin scale a lot better 
than others at the moment. And what applications we can actually run depends a lot on what Bitcoin adoption we have at the moment. So um, I was talking to um, some smart people in Bitcoin, and they were telling me about uh, this idea of molecularization, um, which I won't bore you with, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it as simple as I can very, very quickly. Um, if you want to scale a Bitcoin transaction between two people, you have to find two people close to each other right, to scale that transaction. And so um, different types of transactions, different types of applications have different friction when it comes to adoption. Um, if I want to use Bitcoin to buy food or services at a physical retail establishment, um, then in order for that to be a successful application for Bitcoin, you need a density of physical retail establishments that take Bitcoin and a density of users with Bitcoin to go spend at those. And that's a chicken and egg problem. Um, if I want to do this with an online e-commerce site, it's a lot easier because um, they can find me and I can find them. So, you know, based on that I, I, idea, you're going to see adoption of online e-commerce solutions for Bitcoin faster than you're going to see physical retail solutions. Generally, if something takes uh, just one person to be an application, then it's easier than if it takes two or if it takes a group. We're not going to see social media Bitcoin applications until you have a much, much higher density of users with Bitcoin, because it simply doesn't make sense if you need hundreds and hundreds of people to be interacting with Bitcoin to try to deploy that now. Uh, ironically, if you take that to its logical complete conclusion, what is the one killer app that you can implement with Bitcoin, even if nobody else you care about or know uses Bitcoin? Speculation. I can go and buy Bitcoin and hold it. It doesn't matter who else uses it. I don't have to interact with anybody else. I don't have to transact with anybody else. I can just go buy Bitcoin and hold and use it as a speculative investment. That's exactly why that is the, the killer app for the first several years of Bitcoin, is because it doesn't require density of adoption. Um, and so gradually we're going to see as adoption increases, more and more applications are going to open up. Um, and I, I think it's important to be patient in that particular respect because these things uh, tend to have a very slow ramp up and then they reach a tipping point and then you suddenly see uh, you know it's the 20 year to build an overnight success. Um, and we're going to see these things cascade quite rapidly once you have uh, broader adoption. Um, at the same time, I think the killer applications for Bitcoin are the areas where you have the highest level of friction uh, in traditional financial payments. Uh, Cross-border transactions, remittances, import-export, um, paying associates or uh, partners uh, who are in multiple different countries around the world. Um, you know, Google pays 10,000 affiliate companies for AdWords revenue. Um, and that's an enormous logistical nightmare to do through the traditional banking system. Those types of applications can be streamlined a lot. Now, it, 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 that application will, will work. Um, buying, uh, you know, ironically, the one application that we all talk about all of the time, which is buying a cup of coffee uh, at my local coffee shop with Bitcoin, that's probably going to be among the last things to become Bitcoin. And, and the reason for that is because uh, Visa works quite well, um, as long as you don't mind them funding dictators and seizing money from WikiLeaks. Hey, no problem. Civil rights, who gives a fuck? Um, Visa's quick. It's uh, you know this, this kind of motion with the card doesn't use a lot of calories, but now we have tap to pay. You know, 50 years of innovation has reduced at least by three calories the effort. Now I can just do that instead of that. Yeah, it works. It takes three to six seconds. Um, we're not going to displace that with Bitcoin. Um, you're going to have to look to populations that have serious problems to solve. Problems that involve uh, their ability to feed their children, to give them an education, health care, clean water, to secure their future, to fight a dictator, to gain freedom from oppression. And if you'll give me a second, I think I'm running out of battery on my laptop, and I'm about to lose you all. All 
I have to be careful not to turn around completely because this is only a half shirt. It's only the front. There's nothing in the back. It's it's all a prop here, really. All right. Hey, uh, I've got a hello. Less concrete question for you this time. Um, given that uh, forecasts are just forecasts, we all kind of understand that. Um, do you have any kind of grandiose macroeconomic speculation about like what the next big hurt is going to be? The next big hurt? Yeah. You, I mean, you mean in the broader economy rather than Bitcoin? Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, um, both the US and Europe are, are either, depending on how you look at it, due for another recession or we're still in the previous one or both. Um, you know, would, if if you look at an average of eight year cycles, we're, we're overdue for one, and most of the metrics suck. Um, so I, I think that um, one of the things that, that seems to me at least to be um, very ironic or um, just shocking is how how people will say you know for a currency what you, you really need a central bank so they can control the value of the currency I as so many people I talk to they say well you know Bitcoin I understand it's run by math but you know don't don't we really need central banks to control the value of the currency and how, how do you do that in Bitcoin I think the shocking thing is that right now um, central banks um, the, the, we have this conversation, and you see it in the media, where people are saying, "Will the Federal Reserve raise interest rates or not at the next meeting?" And the real question that most serious economists are asking is, "Can the Federal Reserve <laughs> raise rates, or have they completely lost control?" Um, because we are in uncharted territory. Nobody knows how. Because it's not like uh, they haven't been trying. Like they've been trying for six years now to to get some inflation going and some consumer demand, uh, you know, and nothing's happening. So um, I think a, a lot of the challenges are going to come from the fact that we are nearing the end, the completion of the most radical experiment in monetary policy uh, that started in two thousand eight, and it wasn't Bitcoin; it was zero interest uh, central banking. And that radical experiment is about to, to run into a wall with the speed of a locomotive. Um, and it's going to be really painful for a lot of people. So I, I'm, I'm hoping we manage to find a way out of that. Um, you know, a lot of people have this attitude that if the global economy crashes, Bitcoin's going to do very well. Like, uh, everybody's going to rush out of fiat and put all their money in Bitcoin, and then we're all going to be rich. Well, um, actually more likely is that if you do have a massive crash um, in uh, central banking confidence and, and confidence in other currencies, it's going to be followed by a, a deep recessionary um, collapse in demand again, which is going to dry up all of the investment. Um, and it's going to leave a lot of people um, really, really hurting, which is going to hurt Bitcoin. We're not, uh, you know... What's the expression? No man is an island, right? Um, you, you can't isolate one thing from the rest of the economy and say, well, if it all burns down, I'll be standing on my little castle and un unscathed by all of the, the peasants losing all their wealth. Um, th that's not a healthy attitude. So what I'm worried about is that a financial crisis in the U.S. or the European Union um, isn't going to help Bitcoin. It's going to hurt everyone. Um, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to 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 really change that outcome. So I, I think the real, uh, uh, honestly, I don't think we're going to make it to the next election without a recession. There's going to be a recession before the next election, at least in the U.S. We'll see. This will be the last question. Thank you, Denise. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, how's it going? What do you What do you think of the future of like an an energy backed altcoin or energy energy backed Bitcoin? Oh, Bitcoin is energy backed. Uh, Bitcoin uses, uh, I believe, um, 
six six or seven hundred megawatts of electricity in operation. Um, so Bitcoin is energy backed, and and I don't mean that facetiously. The, the that that very subtle interplay between um, risk and reward incentives for following the consensus rules and getting rewarded. The 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 actual expenditure of energy is a big part of the intrinsic value of Bitcoin. It provides security, which provides trust. So the full faith and credit of the miners who have poured money into their electricity bills is what backs Bitcoin in some ways. Um, Bitcoin is energy backed already, and that makes sense because um, in the end, you have to have something of scarcity to underlie the system. And, and what's scarce in Bitcoin is not the 21 million Bitcoin in themselves, um, because you can't create digital scarcity. What's scarce in Bitcoin is that you can't create the 21 million Bitcoin without expending 600 megawatts of energy. Um, and that actually uh, gives the system the scarcity. Um, so, so Bitcoin scarcity is energy scarcity, and energy scarcity is the fundamental um, unit of value, if you like, um, in our world, in, 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 on our planet. So, so it makes absolute sense. Bitcoin is backed by energy. At least to me, it makes sense. All right, that was a very energetic last question. That was a terrible pun. Yeah. Thanks for being awesome and answering all of our questions as well. Everybody, give a big thanks to Andrea. Thank you. Uh, and a quick shout out to all the people who make this possible. Um, if you could, and since they're too humble to say so themselves, Denise and Paul, who do an amazing job running this meetup group. And Michael, of course, sorry, yes. Uh, please thank your host. Very good. Thank you all and have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.